welcome to today's episode of Talk on Things and Stuff. I have to mute my echo, so there, I'm not hearing myself. Uh, today we're going to dive into a chapter of Mormon history. Now, a few years ago I did a series called Defending the Expositor, where I asked people to come up with uh, fallacious arguments, or with, you know, the, the, the cases where the Nauvoo Expositor really told some outright lies. And it was fun to explore and dig into each of those accusations. I've covered a few of those on past episodes. But I followed that up with something that was different from defending the expositor. It was instead um, trying to discredit the expositor, looking at the um, people who were attempting to discredit the expositor at the time that it was published. And just like the Defending the Expositor series, that also came up with some interesting revelations. And we're going to go into one of the articles on the Thoughts on Things and Stuff website today and really dive into the history of that because when we think about, oh, the Nauvoo City Council deliberated, they determined that the Nauvoo Expositor was a public nuisance and so they ordered it to be destroyed, that sounds very trite and glib. When you compare it well with the examination of, well, who were the actual people on the Nauvoo City Council? Did any of them have any conflicts of interest with the question of, is Joseph Smith actually doing the things that the Nauvoo Expositor claimed it was doing, and so forth? This isn't even looking at the testimony they gave. This is just looking at who makes up the City Council. And so that's going to be the subject of today's uh, article. I have my co-host Yu-Gi-Oh! with me, who is just ridiculous. Uh-oh, we're out of treats. You're out of treats, you. All you got is this rawhide, okay? Now you be good, okay? You, you, you don't, don't interject into this. You just stay there and chew your bone. All right, okay. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in. So we will add our screen. I've placed a link to this article in the live commentary wherever you're looking at this, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, you can find the link there and I'll add it to the description after the fact. I haven't pulled up this article for a few years, so I may be a little bit rusty, but we'll take a look. All right, so, Yu-Gi-Oh, I need you to sit and I need you to stay. Okay, will you do that for me? All right, okay. <clears throat> Discrediting the Expositor, Part 1, The Conflicted Men of the Nauvoo City Council. Okay, this is ridiculous. All right, stay. You're, gonna go, you're, you're not going to be the co-host anymore. Okay, so a year ago, I proposed that readers identify and submit examples of vicious lies that were told by William Law and the other authors of the Nauvoo Expositor, a newspaper, a newspaper published by Mormon defectors and critics, which was subsequently ordered destroyed by the Nauvoo City Council under direction of Mayor Joseph Smith. The, direct, the destruction of the expositor set off a chain of events culminating in the murder of Joseph Smith at the hands of a mob. Now, while the question of whether the expositor contained vicious lies still remains the subject of controversy, there are fascinating aspects of the response to the expositor which have not received great attention. This post is the first in a series that will explore aspects of how Joseph Smith and his allies in church and government responded to the accusations and revelations contained in the Nauvoo Expositor. In particular, we will examine the composition of the body of the Nauvoo City Council and various potential conflicts of interest and allegiance which had the potential to affect the outcome of their deliberation. <clears throat> Not a Helpless Lamb now, regardless of whether the statements in the Nauvoo Expositor were true or not, Joseph Smith and the other leaders of the church understandably saw the paper as injurious to their reputation in the region. William Law and a small group of men were using the power of the press to challenge the most powerful religious and political forces in the city of Nauvoo. The residents of Nauvoo could open up the pages of the Expositor and read the most shocking accusations against the mayor slash general slash prophet slash president and his close confidants. From a public relations perspective, the expositor had claimed control of the narrative, leaving Joseph and his allies in a defensive position. Now, Joseph was at the top of the hierarchy of political military. He was no stranger to adversity and had become adept at exercising the tremendous influence he held in each of those realms to protect his interests. It should have been no surprise that Joseph and his colleagues had resources of their own to equally work upon the minds of the public, eager for material to inform their opinions of events. 
Since Joseph was mayor and as a result ran the city council meetings, and his cousin managed the Mormon-friendly paper, The Nauvoo Neighbor, the response to the accusations of the expositor took place in the halls of government and in the pages of the Mormon-friendly press. As we will see over the next few posts, Joseph used the bully pulpit of his office and his influence over the city council and local newspaper to produce an effective counter-assault upon the character of the publishers of the expositor, as well as plausible, if misguided, legal justification for the destruction of the press. alone as mayor in responding to the disturbance caused by the publication of the expositor. Any action he took which had to be deliberated upon, uh, well actually any action he took had to be deliberated upon and approved by the governing body of the city council over which he presided. The content of their deliberations will be the subject of a future post. In this post we will examine the composition of the men of the council. The very next day, after the publication of the first and only edition of the Nauvoo Expositor, on June 7, 1844, the Nauvoo City Council was convened in regular session. The LDS Church Primary Manual pointed out, and this is the same manual that said that there were many vicious lies told by the Nauvoo Expositor, also described the council saying, Joseph Smith, who was mayor of Nauvoo at the time, called a meeting of the city council, which was composed of both church members and non-members. That's from the primary lesson manual 5, lesson 37, where they cover the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram, and you can find the link in the original article. Okay, so it's clear that the church wants to make the case that the deliberation was not biased because there were both members and non-members of the church on the council. But who exactly were the members of the Nauvoo City Council who met in deciding the response to the expositor? Well, let's take a look. Okay, and so what follows is a table that describes the characteristics of each of the members of the Nauvoo City Council. We have Hiram Smith, who's a 44-year-old man, happens to be Mormon, holds a high calling in the church, also happens to be a member of the Council of Fifty, the Quorum of the Anointed, and Secret Polygamist, a Freemason, and a member of the Nauvoo Legion, and is tied by family to Joseph. We have John Taylor, also an Apostle, member of the Church, member of the Council of Fifty, Anointed Quorum, Freemason, and in the Nauvoo Legion. We have George B. Stiles, who is a member of the Church, we don't know what their calling is, uh, is member of the Council, is not in the Council of Fifty or Anointed Quorum, but is a Freemason, and so on and so forth. We're going to take a look at these things in depth now, but the thing to pay attention to is this question of, are they Mormon? Yes, 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 yes. One person, no. Yes, yes, another person, no, and yes, and another person, no, and yes, 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 yes. So there are essentially three people on the Nauvoo City Council who are not Mormon, um, and we'll go into that because not all of them were present at the deliberation. Now, as you can see, the council was heavily populated by high-ranking church leaders. The tally is 13 Mormons and three non-Mormons on the council. Now, there are several other... And we're going to just scroll down. I want to increase the text a little bit. There's several other important observations to be made from this table. First, attendance. The above table lists all the current members of the council, but who was actually present at the sessions on the 8th and 10th of June, 1844. The Church History Library has scanned and made available the attendance record of the meeting, which can be viewed here. And this, you can click on the link and go and see the actual um, attendance record, but it has those particular dates and the list of which of the city council members were actually present. Now, of the three men on the council who were not Mormon, Sylvester Emmons was not present, as he was actually the editor of the Nauvoo Expositor. Daniel Wells was not present for unknown reasons. And Benjamin Warrington was present, and he was the only non-Mormon attending the sessions which deliberated over the Nauvoo Expositor. That means that in sessions discussing and voting on the fate of the Expositor, there was a single non-Mormon on the council. The remainder of the 13 members of the council were subordinate to Joseph Smith through the church, and one of three secret societies outside the halls of government. This brings us to our next 
observation. Secret societies. In addition to general membership in the church, there were a number of secret societies in Nauvoo, each of which bound its members by oaths of allegiance. In addition to being mayor and president of the church, Joseph was also at the top of each of these secret societies. Now, what may not be apparent by simply tallying the names of the men of the city council is the degree to which many of them are subordinate to or in allegiance with Joseph in these secret organizations. The Council of Fifty. The Council of Fifty was a secret organization composed primarily of high-level church members and a few influential non-members. Serving as a model for a theocracy with Joseph at the head, the Council was established as a working demonstration of the principles and pattern for a future kingdom of God on earth. The members were bound by oath to secrecy regarding the council. Joseph Smith was the president of the council and had been elevated by the council as king on 11th April 1844. We can read from the William Clayton Diaries, quote, In this council was President Joseph Smo chosen as our prophet, priest, and king by Hosannas. This has been further validated by the publication of the minutes of the Council of Fifty that has that action in it. Remember, the prophet, priest, and king is actually a trifold title that traditionally in the Christian world has been reserved for Jesus. But in this case, the council elevated Joseph Smith to that title. Now, the accusations of mixing the influence of the church and state in, that were included in the text of the Nauvoo Expositor were primarily centered around the existence and activities of the Council of Fifty. And you can read more about the Council in a few prior argue, uh, articles that have been published on the website. Of the 14 members of the Nauvoo, that should be 13, of the Nauvoo City Council, seven were also secret members of the Council of Fifty. So. Around half, if not slightly more than half, were also members of the Council of Fifty. Now, the next secret society, the Anointed Quorum. On the 4th of May, 1842, Joseph had introduced, introduced the Temple Endowment Ceremony in the room above his red brick store in Nauvoo. The members who received this ceremony were inducted into what was referred to as the Anointed Quorum and were bound by oath with penalty of death to keep its secrets and to work to build up the church. Here's a picture of the red brick storehouse as it appeared decades later in disrepair. Uh, it was subsequently demolished or fell um, uh, disintegrated and the church rebuilt it. So if you go to Nauvoo, you can visit a replica. Um, Within the context of these gospel introductions, the initiate, initiates made covenants of personal virtue and benevolence and of commitment to the church. They agreed to devote their talents and means to spread the gospel, to strengthen to the church, and to prepare the earth for the return of Jesus Christ. That's a quote from Glenn Leonard about Nauvoo, a place of people, peace, a people of promise. Mormons today who have been through the modern temple ceremony will be familiar with these oaths. Mormons who attended the temple prior to 1990 will also remember the penalties that were part of the promises but have since been removed from the ceremony. On the 28th of September, 1843, Joseph was, by common consent and unanimous voice, chosen president of the quorum and anointed and ordained to the highest and holiest order of the priesthood. That's from the um, American Prophet's record. Now, while the activities of the quorum during its meetings dealt primarily with theological issues, the oath taken by each member of part of the endowment ceremony bound them to do everything in their power to defend and build up the church. With Joseph at the head both of the church and the quorum, it meant protecting their prophet and president. And you can read more about the anointed quorum in an article that is linked on the website. Um, I believe that's a Sunstone or a, a scholarly article from... Um, published in the past. You can link to it there. Of the 14 members of the Nauvoo City Council, six were also members of the Anointed Quorum. Now, the third secret society, the Nauvoo Freemasons. On the 15th of March, 1842, Joseph acted as chaplain for the installation of the Nauvoo Lodge of Freemasons. That evening and the next day saw Joseph elevated to the sublime degree of Master Mason, a procedure which normally takes anywhere between three months and three years. 
But Joseph's rapid elevation to the sublime degree was considered the first instance of a process called making a mason at sight to take place in Illinois. You can read more about that in an article about Freemasonry in Nauvoo that's linked on the website. Now, as part of the oaths and ceremony of the order, Freemasons commit to support and defend each other, particularly those who hold the rank of Master Mason. This is articulated in the portion of their ceremony called the Five Points of Fellowship. Quote, Master then takes the following explanation. Master then makes the following explanation respecting the five points of fellowship. Master to candidate. Brother, foot to foot teaches that you should, whenever asked, go on a brother's errand, if within the length of your cable toe, even if you should have to go barefoot and bareheaded. Knee to knee, that you should always remember a master mason in your devotions to Almighty God. Breast to breast, that you should keep the master mason's secret when given to you in charge as such, as secure and inviolable in your breast as they were in his own before communicated to you. Hand to back, that you should support a master mason, behind his back as before his face, mouth to ear, that you should support his good name as well, behind his back as before his face. This is from the Illustrations of Freemasonry, one of the first uh, Freemason exposés published by William Morgan in 1827. Uh, and I believe, by the by, Joseph Smith married William Morgan's widow after he was disappeared, supposedly by the Freemasons. You can learn more about Freemasonry in a link in the article. Now, of the members of the Nauvoo City Council, six were Freemasons. Finally, the Nauvoo Legion. Well, not a secret organization, but an organization that had hierarchy nonetheless. The Nauvoo Legion was the state-authorized militia provided for by the Nauvoo City Charter. Joseph Smith held the highest rank in the Legion, that of Lieutenant General. As such, all other officers and militia members were subordinate to him in the militia. The court-martial of the Nauvoo Legion gave Joseph as mayor and lieutenant general the authority to call to military service, levy fines, and enforce local law. Now, while Joseph acted in capacity as mayor during the city council meetings, it would not escape the minds of those on the council that they served at a rank and privilege, or lack thereof, at Joseph's discretion in the military hierarchy. You can read The Court Martial of the Nauvoo Legion as published in the LDS Times and Seasons here. If you're familiar with military jargon, you'll realize that court martial isn't the usual term for the legal structure which creates the military entity itself. It's usually a term for legal processes uh, and adjudication within the military according to military law. It's one of the things that other people have commented on is that they used some jargon without actually understanding what it meant in the creation of the Nauvoo Expositor, but there it is. Now, of the members of the Nauvoo City Council, nine were active in the Nauvoo Legion, although all citizens in the area between ages 18 and 45 years of age could be called up to military service in the Legion. Family Relationships Now, Joseph was related to three members of the City Council. Hiram Smith was his older brother. Elias Smith was his cousin, Levi Richards was his brother-in-law by secret polygamous marriage to Rhoda Richards. Now it goes without saying that being related to someone who is at the center of a controversy over which a government body is taking action is an obvious conflict of interest. Members of the council related to Joseph cannot be said to be unbiased and impartial when the issue at hand is a newspaper that made such accusations against their family member, Joseph, who was also on the council. Summary. Now, any of these auxiliary characteristics of the members of the city council described above would be considered significant conflicts of interests in a deliberation that applies modern standards of governmental ethics. Family relations, being subject to religious authority, subordinate positions in secret societies, secret oaths of allegiance and support, and subordinate military rank. It is possible to add up the conflicts for each member of the council. For example, Hiram Smith was himself named in the expositor, and so kind of on the defense at this. He was a member of the church subordinate to Joseph as prophet and president. He was Joseph's brother linked by family. He was a member of the Council of Fifty under Joseph as king. He was a member of the anointed quorum with Joseph as president under secret oath to defend the church. He was a Freemason under secret oath to support Joseph as master mason. And he was a chaplain in the Nauvoo Legion subject to the military, military authority of 
of Joseph as the lieutenant general. That is a total of seven conflicts of interest, any one of which should have compelled Hiram to recuse himself from any deliberation, deliberation over an issue related to accusations made about himself and Joseph, such as the Nauvoo Expositor Affair. Now contrast that with Benjamin Warrington, who, as the only non-member, had only one conflict of interest in that he was subordinate to Joseph in the Nauvoo Legion. Here is the total of conflicts of interest for each council member. Hiram Smith, 7, John Taylor, 5, George P. Stiles, 2, Aaron Johnson, 4, William Phelps, 2, Benjamin Warren, 1, Edward Hunter, 4, Levi Richards, 4, Orson Spencer, 3, Elias Smith, 3, George W. Harris, 1, Samuel Bennett, 2, and Joseph Smith himself, uh, with a grand total of 7. Now, defenders of Joseph will likely argue that modern standards of ethics should not be applied to this government body in the 1800s. The fact of the matter is that modern standards of ethics have evolved to respond to the unavoidable bias which is inherent when a member of government has such close ties to any um, <clears throat> subject that is the focus of official government action. Modern standards of ethics responded to pre-existing problems. They didn't create the problems. The bias and conflicts of interest were present in the Nauvoo City Council and arguably led to an outcome which was not based on sound legal principles and notions of justice. Conclusion When you hear defenders of, when you hear defenders of the church make the argument that the Nauvoo City Council was a balanced mix of members and non-members who came to a thoughtful solution to the threat of mob violence invoked by the Nauvoo Expenser, Expositor, don't believe it for a minute. The Nauvoo City Council was composed overwhelmingly of men who were subordinate to Joseph Smith through many layers of conflicts of interest, and there was only one non-member in that group. Wait till you see how the vote went. The state of affairs left no doubt that the outcome of the deliberations of the council would be exactly what Joseph intended from the start, the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor and the silencing of its publishers. Now, when it said, wait till you see how the vote went, the church published a decree that the destruction of the expositor was a unanimous decision by the Nauvoo City Council. But when you go and you look at the actual tally page that recorded the votes, there was one vote against the destruction of the Nauvoo expositor, and it happened to be that one guy who was a non-member. So it was split right down the allegiance lines of the church and all those other secret societies. Now, in the posts that follow in this series, we'll explore other aspects of the steps that were taken to discredit the expositor and see how adept Joseph was at using the Mormon-friendly press to counter the accusations levied by William Law and his colleagues. Okay, so, <clears throat> let's see here. That is uh, the article examining the conflicts of interest that existed on the part of the members of the Nauvoo City Council. I'll go ahead and open up the phone lines and hopefully we'll have things that actually work this time. Just get ready. There's going to be technical issues. There always is. We'll just take them in stride. If you would like to call and give a little bit of your own perspective and feedback on what we've covered today, then you can dial 210-422-2222 and uh, share what's on your mind. Uh, in the meantime, we've uh, got some comments that we'll go over. <clears throat> Uh, Scott Wardell uh, correctly pointed out that both Joseph and Hiram were Freemasons. The Phil said, you should be ashamed, John. If there was any conflict of interest, it was sec it was since secret, it was sacred. Well, <laughs> that's technically true. You know, anything that's considered secret is actually sacred if it has anything to do with the church. And that sacredness justifies any deception, any lie, or anything, because it's serving the higher purpose of the kingdom of God. And if you want to know more about that rationalization, just look at the Talk on Things and Stuff episodes where Radio Free Mormon and I discuss Elder Oaks' talk to the law students and graduates of uh, the J. Reuben Clark Law School back in... I think it was 1993. It's a fascinating read. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, again, if you would like to share any of your perspective on what has been covered here, the phone number is 210-422-2222. And um, other than that, I think in the original article, there were some comments. Um, 
it's it's fun usually to see what people respond to. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's see. George Harris may have been co-husband with Joseph in a polyandrous marriage to Lucinda Morgan Harris in that he had housed Joseph for a time prior to Nauvoo and was personally invited to Nauvoo. So that's another potential conflict. Cheryl Bruno, who is a phenomenal researcher, if you want to know about Freemasonry, Joseph Smith, polygamy, just Google Cheryl Bruno's name and read anything that she's written. She does an excellent job of sticking to the facts and um, pointing things out. Uh, she she commented, you've done a commendable job here. Just add to your list of Freemasons. Levi Richards was made a Master Mason in January of 1844, Elias Smith in March of 1844, and Samuel Bennett in July of 1842. Of those on the council who weren't Masons, three were the non-members, and I haven't actually checked to see if they weren't Masons, they just weren't Mormon Masons. And two additional members, W.W. Phelps and George W. Harris, were renounced Masons, in that they were before, but were not at the time. They left the fraternity before they joined the church, and they left over the Morgan affair, and would not have been eligible to rejoin in Nauvoo. Okay, and uh, that just reflects, it was kind of hard to really pin down the dates on some of these people joining the Freemasons. So um, I was grateful that Cheryl sh um, shared some of her research with us there. Okay, so uh, it's okay if we don't get any calls, we'll just close this uh, discussion up. If you would like to share your perspective, you can dial 210-422-2222. Um, speaking of what future articles there are in this subject, uh, in a future episode, we will cover something. Um, let's see, if we go to Thoughts on the Nauvoo Expositor. There's a, several articles. Um, one of them that was really interesting in this was looking at the actual witnesses that came forward in the deliberation as recorded in the minutes of the meeting. Uh, because when you look at who the witnesses were that were called up and the nature of their testimony, it reveals something very interesting about what was actually going on in the city council leading up to the declaration that the Nauvoo Expositor was a nuisance and therefore its destruction was justified. So you have that to look forward to in the future. Um, <clears throat> In the meantime, without any calls, we will just wrap it up and close from here. So until next time, this has been Talk on Things and Stuff. Take care.